Welcome to worship with Fairview Presbyterian Church this last Sunday of August. My name is the Reverend Stephanie Bishop and I am the transitional minister here in this interim period at Fairview. Even though we are still in the midst of a time apart, the church is still very much alive and working during this time. I hope that you received the newsletter for September already and have had a chance to read my report. I won't go into the full body of that letter. Rather, I will encourage you to read it if you have not, or to reach out to me or Margot if you did not receive it. If you have already enthusiastically taken the survey included in the newsletter, there, thank you so much. If you have not, I implore you to do so very soon. This survey is vital in the search for your next installed pastor and works to be sure that your voice is heard in that process. If you have not noticed yet, Fairview has a new web design. I invite you to go to fairviewpres.org to check out our new look. There you will also be able to see updates and information about our upcoming event, the Run for Shelter. Your continued support uh, of the Lawrenceville Co-op is appreciated. If you're able to give just a little extra in order that Ray can shop for items most needed to deliver to that ministry in your community, it would be so appreciated. And now let me introduce your liturgist for the day, Bruce Lindsay. Please join him in the call to worship. Sing a song of thanksgiving. Declare God's wondrous deeds. For the Lord dwells among the people. The glory of God abides with us. Trusting in the power of God to save, let us confess our sins before God and this assembly. Holy God, we confess that our love for you and for others has not been genuine. We have not held fast to what is good and we have lagged in affection for our brothers and sisters. We have not been patient in suffering, nor have we persevered in prayer. We have repaid evil for evil and have failed to live peaceably with all. Forgive us our sin, free us from the fear of power of evil, and help us trust in the power of your everlasting goodness. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ has broken the power of sin and evil and has opened to us the way of eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Almighty God, in the self-giving love of Christ, you have revealed the path of salvation. Give us courage to deny our selfish desire and bear the cross of discipleship, that we may live as those who have no fear of death and receive the joy of everlasting life. And now, by the power of your Spirit, O Lord, Make your word become a joy to us and the delight of our hearts. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For the scripture reading, we will have Romans 12, 9 through 16. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Hey kids, Mr. Lindsay just read for you some scripture that comes from the book of Romans, which is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to people. And in it, he gives them advice about how to live inside a community. And I think it's important to talk with you all about these things right now, especially when it's hard for us to gather in communities. We have community at school and we have community within our families. And then we also have our church community. And I know that y'all have your, fam your family community still going on strong. And I'm so glad for that. But your schools and your, your church probably, your, I don't know if your schools are meeting or not, but your church is not, and we all miss being together and being in community. But Paul's words can help us um, 
live in a certain way, even though we can't be together. We can still love one another like like someone loves us. That's what he means when he says mutual affection. Um, he says, do not lag in zeal. And he means be excited about being in relationship with other people and show your enthusiasm to them. Um, and be be that same way in serving the Lord. And so remember to pray to the Lord and be a servant of the Lord when you go out. And he wants you to be hopeful and be patient, especially during this time when things don't seem so great for us. He just, the Lord wants us to be patient and Paul encourages us to do that. And he asks us to contribute to other people. So help out people who are in need and even people who don't treat us the way that we want to be treated, we should still, uh, Paul's words are bless them. So we should still do good for them, even if we feel like they're not doing good for us. That is how Jesus behaved, and that is how God would want us to behave. And then lastly, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So that's about um, this big word called empathy. And so that's about being able to sit with people in whatever they have going on, be happy with people who are happy and be able to be sad with someone who is sad because you are giving them hope and you are bringing them some joy in their suffering when you sit with people who are suffering. So I know this, uh, this was kind of a, a hard passage to hear and understand, and I hope that I've helped you hear it and understand it a little bit better, and I hope you have a great week ahead. Let's pray. Good and loving God, we thank you for these children who hear your words and want to be your servants and live in your community. We just ask that you be with their parents and their teachers who help to nurture them. And especially during this time when we all can't be together, we just ask that you especially be with them among their families, helping them to learn and to grow. We pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 15, verses 15 through 21. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and bring down retribution for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, do not take me away. Know that on your account, I suffer insult. Your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of merrymakers, nor did I rejoice. Under the weight of your hand I sat alone, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Truly, you are to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you turn back, I will take you back, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. It is they who will turn to you, not you who will turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I preach on the life of Jesus, I don't feel the need to talk history with you all, but I feel that when we get back into the Old Testament text, often the context of the life and time of the passage descri describes can be helpful in explicating meaning from the words we read. I also think it is a really good practice in empathy. When we profess the Apostles' Creed and we say we are in communion with the saints, we are professing to be standing alongside in solidarity with all those who have gone before us, who have stood for what is good and right in the eyes of God. If we can put ourselves in, say, Jeremiah's shoes for the purposes of today's study, we can better understand not only why Jeremiah felt and expressed these words and then could hear those words from God, but we also can develop the skills to be more in tune with those around us, more able to hear other stories and feel their pain and understand their sufferings. So with that, let's look at Jeremiah. 
As I mentioned last week, Jeremiah was a prophet whose career began in 627 BCE, 600 some years before Jesus began his work. The political climate was volatile as usual for that time frame, and Jeremiah suffered rejection and contempt, persecution, imprisonment, as well as exile for his prophesying. Jeremiah is a Moses-like figure called by God but answers reluctantly. With this theme of God putting words in the prophet's mouths, as we read here in verse 16, your words were found and I ate them, we can get the sense that Jeremiah had no option but to take the words from God, digest them, and regurgitate them to the people, the people who did not like to hear them. And this is where we sit with Jeremiah in this week's passage. Jeremiah is sick of speaking God's truth, being faithful to God, and suffering for it. Or in one verse in this text, it seems to ju he just wishes he could have a little fun. Just a little, O oh God. If, if we're being judgy about Jeremiah's words, we might say he is whining to God in these first verses. He says, I have put up with a lot of abuse for you, O oh God. I stayed away from parties too. You, you, O oh God, you held me down. You refused to take care of me. And then Jeremiah says what might have been the final blow. You, like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail, like waters that don't quench your thirst, like waters that don't wash you clean. Oh God, Jeremiah cries out. Jeremiah calls God out. What is Jeremiah doing? Is he whining? Is that what he's doing? I don't think so. What does it remind you of? This is more than just whining. This is stone cold lament. This is Jeremiah not holding back. He is over it. He is done. Kathleen O'Connor, a renowned scholar of Jeremiah and once a professor at Columbia Theological Seminary, writes that when she first began studying Jeremiah, the confessions that make up chapters 11 through 20, which includes our passage this morning, were the only parts of Jeremiah she liked. She clarifies why, stating, I think it was the seething anguish and personal voice of these prayers that attracted me. They reached out with invisible threads to make claims on me somewhere beneath my consciousness. She admits that at first she thought they were confessions that belonged to Jeremiah alone as prayers about vocational meltdown. Perhaps you can identify with that. When have you thought, this job is too much? I don't know how I will ever accomplish this. I can tell you that this pandemic has created moments like this for so many of us, maybe none more so than all you teachers out there. But O'Connor no longer limits these confessions of Jeremiah to this one category, and she now has a different perception of them. She sees them also as prayers for people mired in loss. O'Connor uses Jeremiah's laments as means to address trauma and theodicy. Theodicy is a difficult concept to even think of, much less address. I think I have made the attempt from this pulpit on one other occasion, perhaps. But to remind you, theodicy is basically a fancy word for the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Jeremiah is basically posing this query to God through his impassioned complaint in the passage. He tells God he's being so good, yet he is persecuted. How often have you cried out to God? This is not fair. How often have you taken the high road and found the oxygen supply to be depleted up there and you struggle to breathe? How often have you petitioned God for help along the way because the path is oh so steep and rocky? Or have you even accused God of abandoning you on your journey? Lamenting, crying out to God can, as in Jeremiah's case, give us a release of emotions and create a connection to God. But the issue of the Odyssey remains, right? Why are these things happening to Jeremiah? Why do bad things happen to him when he is working for God? Why do bad things not happen to the very people who are doing evil? We ask these questions in present day circumstances from a personal level all the way up to global scenarios. We ask questions when natural disasters such as a pandemic or a hurricane or tornado or fire hit us and cause such destruction and uproot our lives. I turn to a present day theologian, John Swinton, and his book called Raging with Compassion to confront this question of the Odyssey. Swinton immediately acknowledges what I just said. Um, these questions we have are not bad or wrong questions, but he implores that trying to answer the questions themselves can become a form of evil. He gives us this example. If we were to offer the mother of a torture victim a well thought through theodicy, 
that explain clearly the significance of human sin, the fall of humans, and the importance of human free will as the reasons for her experience, what good would it do? Even if she does ask why God allowed this to happen, would the answer really help her? Would it draw her closer to God, her only source of hope, or would it push her even further away? To put this a little closer to home, for I hope none of us here has had a child who has been tortured, have you ever had your life suddenly uprooted or experienced a sudden loss? For many of us, the answer is yes, and recently. And have you ever had someone tell you that what has happened to you is part of God's plan? People say this all the time. You might have said this yourself. I have probably said it to someone at some point. We mean it to comfort. We mean to comfort with those words. But let's be honest, do we know God's plan? Do we know if God had a hand in the bad that has befallen us in order to turn it to good, or if some sort of evil was the root of our misfortune? The answer is no, of course we do not know. And we risk doing harm to others when we pretend to know who God is in the bleak circumstances of lives that are hurting. So how do we address the Odyssey faithfully and helpfully in our communities? I imagine many people simply just choose not to face it at all or choose to avoid others' sufferings, but that should not be so. Theologian Stanley Hauerwas suggested the early church did not attempt to develop the Odysseys, but rather sought to create communities within which the impact of evil and suffering could be absorbed, resisted, and transformed as the people of God waited for Christ's return to earth. How can this church, this community, resist evil and counter suffering? Years ago, I went before the examinations committee of the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta. I had to present my faith statement beforehand, and when I sat before the committee, one of my favorite professors was there, but he critiqued my statement. He noted he had never before read it, in spite of being one of the professors for two classes in which I, had, I was required to turn one in. Um, another professor had actually read it and commented for those classes. So my professor said, more notably, that I had mentioned nothing about the cross. And I had to take a minute and quickly do a self-inventory. I had written my faith statement about three years prior, and I had read it and tweaked it several times since then. No, I had not said anything about Jesus' death on the cross. I was not denying that it had happened. I had written wholeheartedly about the resurrection, and I was not trying to discount the depth and meaning of the event, I explained. I hate that we did that to Jesus, I explained. I hate that we killed Jesus. I rarely wear a cross around my neck because it makes me feel bad. I didn't mean to leave out the cross, but I assume that is why I left it out. I, I assume I left it out subconsciously. Dr. Douglas told me to add the cross into my faith statement. I'm pretty much telling you the same thing now. Make sure the cross is in full view of your faith. I don't think I failed to see the cross in light of evil and suffering. Really, I feel called to ministry because I think I'm pretty good at sitting with the suffering. But the resisting evil is harder, don't you think? The cross reminds us that if we don't resist evil, we're probably going to feel really bad about it later. We cannot deny the cross, we cannot deny that evil exists, and we cannot deny that we often have a part in it. John Swinton writes in his book that loving God does not, have, does not take away the pain that evil inflicts, but it does transform it. When we continue steadfastly in our faith, our pain is not removed, but the sting of pointless death has been removed. Apostle Paul writes words to the Romans to teach them about alleviating suffering and conquering evil. Bruce began our Romans passage this morning reading to the children, but let us hear the rest of that passage now. It's Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This too is the word of the Lord. Paul urges the early church to resist evil 
In the verses I covered with the children, we hear things that clearly make sense and might even seem easy if we are in the right mindset to do them. But in these latter verses, we read about how we are to act in light of what appears to me situations very similar to how Jeremiah felt about his persecutors and lamented about in his confession to God. Paul encourages the early church members to approach all with a spirit of kindness and allow God to exact judgment. Here, we are called to a resistance of evil that goes beyond just resisting. We are called to be good to those that we consider enemies. This will take mindful practice and does not come easy. This is taking that high road I mentioned earlier, the one where the oxygen supply is low. This will include not making assumptions about another person based on appearance or things that others have said. This might look like extending a hand in peace to someone who you haven't been able to forgive just yet and trusting that the forgiveness will come. After all, the cross is about reconciliation. This should be happening inside our church communities. We should practice this here so that when we go out into the larger world where people really might be very different, we can get a first impression that they are good and start from there. We can be hospitable to strangers in an effort to ward off evil that we might inadvertently be contributing to ourselves. If, or rather when, you are feeling like Jeremiah, don't be afraid to cry out to God. Jeremiah's prayer stands as a great example for the community in how to struggle through the storms of life. Jeremiah's lament keeps him in communication with God and forms an unbreakable connection. Let us remember what God says back to Jeremiah. Picking up in our text after Jeremiah has accused God of being like waters that fail, the Lord reminds the prophet to turn back, to stand before God again. I will take you back, God says. What a powerful reminder of God's grace. And then God gives encouragement, another promise that if Jeremiah stands against evil, God will bring good. We cannot see God's plan for us. We especially cannot explain God's plan to someone who is in the midst of pain and suffering. But God has given us the ultimate example in showing empathy. Thanks to God's words and Jesus' saving death on the cross, we know that evil will not have the last word. If we as Christians, as faithful followers, will turn and see God, if we can turn from our own self-centeredness to a God-centered frame of mind, if we can work together in our communities for the good of God's kingdom, we can stand against evil in the world, and we can survive life's struggles. Let it be so. Amen. Let us give as God has so abundantly given to us. and tenderly Jesus is calling calling for you and for me see on your portals he's waiting and watching watching for you and for me Yeah.
Let us pray. Almighty God, receive these gifts that we offer with grateful hearts and use us for your ministry in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace, let us pray to God, saying, Merciful God, hear our prayer. For the Church of Jesus Christ, merciful God, hear our prayer. Bless the Church, deliver it from evil, and make it holy in every way that all people may see the light of your salvation through the witness of your faithful servants. For our pastors, teachers, and ministers, merciful God, hear our prayer. Arouse the leaders of your church to prophetic witness, especially during this time of unrest in our country. Help them to proclaim your justice fearlessly, to embody your righteousness sincerely, and to practice your mercy selflessly. For the world and for its leaders, merciful God, hear our prayer. Uphold the leaders of governments both here and abroad. Give them a posture of truth, sound judgment, and merciful hearts, and lead them to do what is right in upholding the common good. For the good earth, merciful God, hear our prayer. Let earth be a gentle home for us. Help us find a way back to abundant life in the wake of this virus. Subdue the violence of storm and earthquake and heal the destruction of hurricane, fire, and drought that life may flourish and every creature rejoice in the goodness of creation. For children, merciful God, hear our prayer. Bless children and those who care for them. Be especially with our teachers and parents who are educating in the midst of these new and tenable circumstances. Give them strength and hope. Enable our children to thrive in mind and body and grow in wisdom and strength. For the sick and those in distress, merciful God, hear our prayer. Heal, heal those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, and uphold those who are able to support them in their need. These prayers we offer through Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate act of empathy. Keep the cross squarely in your view. Resist evil, sit with others in suffering, and remember that evil, suffering, and not even death are the final answer. And now go in peace, knowing that the Lord our God has plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans for your hope and your future. Amen. Hello everyone, my name is Janet Russell. I am a member of Fairview Presbyterian Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. This video will inform you about one of our community mission projects, Run for Shelter 5K. Run for Shelter 5K is a walk or run that financially supports the Lawrenceville Salvation Army's Home Sweet Home Gwinnett program. This rapid response program is designed to address the needs of our homeless families within our community. Home Sweet Home provides immediate and permanent housing, case managers, financial training, and spiritual guidance. This will be our 13th year for Run for Shelter. Number 13 may not resonate well with some, but it does mirror these troubling days. Due to CDC COVID-19 guidelines, we are now doing a virtual race in place. You have one month from October 14th to November 14th, 2020 to walk or run 3.1 miles in a location of your choice. Or if you wish, just register without committing to running or walking. Each registrant will receive a great Run for Shelter t-shirt. So let's get some facts. 
In 2019, Home Sweet Home Gwinnett served 140 families, 375 individuals, and provided 7,800 nights of shelter. Now, we've all been affected by this pandemic, but presently there is 8,000 to 10,000 families struggling to find shelter. The need is overwhelming and you might not realize how a little help make a, makes a huge impact. Giving is really a gift to ourselves. It takes you out of yourself, beyond your world, and feeds your heart and soul. We are all in the big picture as our responsibility has always been to take care of our world and each other. Let's start with this simple act of kindness. The fact is, we need you to better the lives of others. We do hope you'll join us, and thanks for watching.